Well, welcome uh, to everyone and those on the phone, too. Um, this is uh, the uh, task force committee that came out of uh, Senate Bill 222 that uh, probably should have preceded what we tried to do in the last legislative session, and that is to uh, create a, a more uniform uh, dual credit uh, advanced options uh, system for uh, schools with the bottom line intent being uh, to get more of our high school students earning uh, college credits while in high school. We started working on this as part of the original 242, Senate Bill 242 process, uh, gosh, three, three, four years ago. And <coughs> in the session, uh, it became apparent to us that we just didn't have the technical uh, issues cleared up in order to do what we had hoped to do. And so um, that's the real purpose of this group of all of you to uh, help get to the technical place with respect to uh, finances and assessments and, and how to reach our uh, ultimate goal. So um, my name is uh, Mark Hass, uh, Chair of the uh, Senate Education Committee. I'm going to go around the room and, and uh, have what everyone uh, introduce themselves, um, uh, beginning with the uh, person that's actually named in the legislation, the uh, Chief Education Officer uh, of Oregon. So I'm Nancy Golden. I'm the Chief Education Officer for the State of Oregon. Peyton Chapman, uh, Portland Public Schools, Lincoln High School Principal. I'm Richard Donovan. I work for the legislature as a committee administrator for the Senate Education and House Education Committees, and I'm just here as observing. I'm not a committee member. Uh, I'm Margaret DeLacy, Vice President of the Oregon Association for Talented and Gifted, and I'm also here as an observer. Gerald Hamilton, Interim Executive Director, CCWD, and I was an invitee. Uh, good afternoon, Carlene Drago Starr. I'm with Oregon Tech, and I'm just observing today. Good afternoon. My name is Hilda Rosselli, and uh, I work with the Oregon Education Investment Board, and as such, I'm supporting uh, Nancy. I serve as Director for College and Career Readiness, and will be staffing this uh, group. Uh, my name is Nori Jiba. I'm from Bend. I'm a private investor, uh, represent business interest. I'm also a local uh, board member in Ben Lapine. I was original. Mem I was an original member of the Oregon Education Investment Team and the uh, original <laughs> Higher Education Coordinating Commission. Okay, we have, we have some folks, folks on the telephone here. Representative hey, John Huffman, state representative out of District 59, live in the Dells. Longtime member of the House Education Committee and Vice Chair of the House Higher Ed Committee. Toya? Toya Fick, Government Affairs Director with Stanford Children, Oregon. Okay. Is that it on the phone? There's somebody yeah. else? Hi, uh, Cindy Romper with Oregon Alliance of Independent Colleges and Universities. Oh, hi, Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hi. I, I and Nathan Howard, Senator Mark Hass's staff person. <laughs> okay, is that it on the phone? Um, Kendra Colley, Dean of Academic Affairs, Portland Community College, observing today. Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, I think one of the first orders of business, uh, Hilda, is to elect a chairperson. And I don't see a process for that uh, spelled out anywhere, so I'll just sort of add live here. If I could, um, I would like uh, to nominate Nancy Golden to uh, chair of this just because of uh, the, uh, uh, her role, her access to staff, and because, as I mentioned, the, uh, the more technical nature of uh, what it is we uh, hope to accomplish in this legislation. Senator Hess, this is Rep Huffman, and I would second that. Okay. Any other uh, comments? Uh, okay, then it uh, looks like we have a new chair, uh, Nancy Golden, as, as the chair of our Accelerated Learning Committee, and I will turn it over to you and let you go down the agenda or okay, great. wherever you want. And Thank you. Should we just see who else came in the room? Sure. So do you want to introduce yourself? So my name is Betsy Salter, and I just came to observe. Is that okay? Nice sure. to have you, of course. I'm David Edwards. Director of uh, Research and Policy with the OEIB. 
So I want to begin by saying I am thrilled to be chair because I, as a recent superintendent, I saw um, all the time how a student could get high school credit, what a difference it would make for them going to college. And for some of our students, it was really the only way they were going to get to college because uh, some students could get 40, 50 credits if they were really working. And that made it obtainable for families where, when I know you see this all the time, right? So... Um, and I think we've all heard stories about even though we're able to do that, there's some barriers that prevent us from doing it for more students. So I, I do believe there's many more students who could access this and be successful. So it's a great committee to chair. I appreciate that. So um, <clears throat> with that, I think um, today, oh, and I just want to say, because one thing Senator Half said in nominating me for chair was that there would be access to um, staff, and that is true, and I wanted to make sure David Edwards, who is here, in addition to Hilda, is one of our staff members, and um, he actually was a legislator too, so that's great, and he's the person when Senator Hafs was talking about, we really have to be clear about what is the finance, what would be the cost of this. Uh, David is the person who's going to be responsible for doing that. So um, he was on the Ways and Means Committee, right, when, when you were a legislator, and he's just kind of wicked smart. So we know that he can, he can get this job done. So we're thrilled that you're here and expect you'll be at all of these meetings. So um, much of what we're doing today is a little bit procedural just because we've got to get set up. So if you want to look at 2.0 on the agenda... Um, what you're going to see, just in going through your packet, <clears throat> maybe we should start there. If you just look at your charge, so the second page in the packet is a charge. And Gerald, would you mind, um, some people don't have, do you have a packet or anything? Gerald, could you share? Oh, sure. There we you go. Know, we have another one. That's <clears throat> How about, do you need? I have an agenda. Wait, 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 sure. Okay, wait, wait, sure. Gerald can share. Well, sure. can share. Do you have it on I'm your sure. computer? Uh, I also wanted to share with you that if you have um, internet access, all of these materials now are posted at the Oregon Education Investment Board web list website, and it's listed as the Accelerated Learning Committee. So all of the documents that are here today um, are now posted there, and we'll continue to put our notes and materials up there as we move forward. So can we all look at the second page, which is just the charge, and I'm going to ask everyone to take a minute to read the charge and then see if there's any questions. Any questions about the charge? You know, um, one thing I would just like to say, and I know we, we met with the senator to just kind of pre-plan this one day, and um, there's a number of related opportunities happening, and I think it's important for us to keep those in mind. Uh, for example, um, when the the Senate committee met during legislative days, we were talking about uh, paying for the first year or two years of college. That's something that we're really looking at now. Um, the second thing is we've all heard about pay it forward, pay it back. That's something that's related. And then the third thing is we just had a um, meeting actually with the governor to begin to explore uh, what we're calling the fifth year, and what that's really about is a lot of school districts um, wanting to do what's best for their students are, even though students have the credits to graduate, instead of graduating, they hold their diploma, and then they can come for a fifth year where they'll get funding in the school district and funding at the community college or university. The, the way they fund are different between the two, and they get to do a fifth year. So we brought in a, a number of people who were using that strategy just to get clear about why. And, you know, what you really heard is there's a lot of students that who they know their high school, if there's a counselor from the high school who's working with them and helping them integrate into um, the uh, post-secondary, and there's a counselor on the other end, these are kids who typically would never get to college. So there's a lot of related efforts, and I think what we need to do through this process 
is get clear what we're doing here, but keep those others in mind because to some degree they're all related to each other and we don't want them pushing against each other. We want them supporting each other. So any other kind of initiatives out there we should be aware of? Yeah. The uh, Higher Education Coordinating Commission has been directed by the OEIB to look at the Oregon Opportunity Grant, so they will be coming forward with some recommendations about that process. Okay, so we're going to make sure through our office with Hilda's help and David's help, we're in working with our legislators, obviously we're really up to speed on what's happening on all of those. And there could be a moment where some of them combine. So we just need to, to make sure we're tracking that. So any questions about any of that? The very good news is this is a real focus. You can see it's yes. as, as we've created the se se seamless system, people are becoming really clear to reach the 40-40-20 goal. We really need to make this so there's access to post-secondary, and we all know what that does for jobs, so it's really a terrific, terrific thing. I guess the one thing that I would say is it's not written here, but I'm assuming that ec equitable mm -hmm. access um, funding and opportunities are part of our charge, and it's just not explicitly stated, but I, I would hope that we all, and, and I've seen it, I'm at a school where kids do often leave with 42 college credits through the IB program, um, and there's a cost to that, and, and I see which kids are accessing that right now and, and which ones aren't, and, but I also used to be at Madison High School, you know, a high poverty school, and, and we tried to help students access college credits, primarily through PCC, Portland Community College, um, so I just, I really just wanted to talk about a little bit of how we're going to look at this through the equity lens. But. Well, let's, let's talk about it since you opened that door. Mm -hmm. um, well, we know those kids who are earning 42 credits. Uh, we have some friends who's, whose son went to Canby and, goes, and he got 65 credits. He's a freshman at Oregon this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always make the analogy, you know, we don't, we don't need to worry about Susan, Suzanne Bonamici's kids. They're going to be fine. These are those kids that uh, we probably, if, if they were all like that, we wouldn't even be able to. I'm trying to get the kids at Lincoln who, whose parents are not Suzanne Bonamici mm -hmm. or Mark Hass or any of and that's and that's it's not necessarily an equity thing. It's a it's almost to me it's it's more of a motivational thing. It turns out that you know it's it, it is you know uh, often students I think uh, from uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, homes or you know the lower socioeconomic thing. And it's also from uh, just sort of busy families where they don't have the motivational uh, tools uh, there and trying to get to get. Uh, that is has proven to be very elusive in, in the legislature. It's almost, you know, how do you legislate kicking somebody in the rear to get them going, short of requiring uh, the high schools to make sure they graduate with six credits or nine credits. And we had that. That was in a proposed bill, or it, that was in this pro earlier draft of this, mm -hmm. that there would be nine credits upon graduation. So I don't know how you get how you get to those those kids sort of a mandate. I think there's some scaffolding that needs to happen mm -hmm. because I think all students want to be college ready and college experienced. Um, so, you know, it's good that we're looking at the achievement compacts at the same time, you know, getting all kids ready to learn, learning to, you know, ready to read to learn, and I hope to have a joy of reading at the same time uh, by third grade. But as we scaffold those skills, yeah. we also need to look at where kids are and which skills they can access right now. I mean, to be honest with you, there are some programs I've seen where kids are taking college credits, but the credits are maybe in PE or things that aren't necessarily going to make them a 21st century college and career competitive ready. Mm -hmm. um, or we're going to have a lot of PE teachers, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so I think there's so much research we have to do. You know, what credits are being accessed now, by whom, and we need to look at that data by ethnicity and race and SES and gender, and then what the goals are, because with the 40-40-22, um, we don't necessarily even um, want to just be talking about students um, going to four-year colleges, but also getting college credits to help them access two-year colleges or certificate mm -hmm. programs. Uh, so, and there are some barriers in place. I mean, we ran into the barriers at Madison High School all the time. What you know, at the time there was no bus pass, so transportation to get to PCC was an issue. But the cost of the credits, a PCC credit is $88. Mm -hmm. 
and that's a minimal cost. Then there's the required registration fee and the lab materials fees, mm -hmm. and then you can quickly get to $125 per kid. Yes. So again, maybe in my school, we do community outreach, and we try and scholarship every kid who couldn't. We do that for IB tests, for example. Mm -hmm. We don't ever say you can't take an IB test because you can't pay. We figure out a way to do that. But some communities can't do that, so there wasn't a, a budget that we could access that was large enough for all the kids we wanted to help earn college credits. Um, so some, for some people, and I would imagine in rural areas, it might be transportation or it might be access to online labs mm -hmm. to access the online college credits, which are also growing in availability. Um, there must be other people who have a lot of questions. I have more questions. Yeah. Um, so what I'm, what I'm starting to track is some of the barriers um, to making it happen, and that's good because we want to create the system that overcomes the barriers. That's really the job of the Oregon Education Investment Team along with partnering with legislators and other key partners. So, you know, another one I can think of and then I'm going to ask other people just will stay on this conversation in the spirit of equity and mm -hmm. the equity lens is um, so many students, they go into um, developmental classes and the developmental classes don't count towards their degree. And, you know, I think there's some emerging ideas about best practice, which is showing that placing students in developmental classes really isn't the best practice to get them and keep them in community colleges or four-year colleges. Now, we know with the um, birth to college and career pathway that eventually the hope is what you're talking about. The kids will come up and they'll be on grade level in third grade, and so there won't be a need for as many developmental classes. But, you know, that's, that's many years before we get there, so we really have to think about developmental education and start looking at the best practices around that. So, other barriers that kind of exist in... I, I wouldn't call it a barrier, but it seems to me that, you know, as I've thought about these, these programs, one of the things that the K-12 does really well, I think, is guidance, and I think... I think sometimes the community colleges don't do a good job of guidance. I mean, the, the structures are for guidance, guidance students who need guidance. I mean, you're talking about a group, from my K-12 experience, who need a, a lot of hands-on guidance. I mean, they need to be worked with, and they need, to, they need somebody to role model and talk to them about where to go. I think sometimes the community colleges, that isn't the structure we've established. And I completely concur with your, death and your developmental education conversation. Any other thoughts? Well, certainly the fiscal models are going to be something important, but also reporting. We've found that sometimes our own uh, desire to do a good job of reporting things have actually caused people to sometimes count in a different way. For example, you know, withholding the diploma so that, you know, a student uh, can access those things, but then it hurts us in another way by uh, not reflecting true four -year uh, numbers of people right. who yeah. completed the four-year graduation requirements. So I think reporting will have to be a place where we look at alignment and, and figuring out what works best to um, support and you know, incentivize <coughs> this pro process. There's always been this talk of this perverse uh, kind of disincentive between the high schools and the mm -hmm. college where... Mm -hmm. The schools don't want to give up their ADMW money. The community colleges can't be expected to do this stuff for free. And yet, and those work against the student that's trying mm -hmm. to get the 42 credits before they go down there. Yeah. I think one related to that is um, that if you want to teach like a college now class in high school, you need a precise <laughs> certificate. So you could be a physics teacher who's getting everyone to pass an IV class, but if your master's isn't in physics, then you couldn't teach a college now physics class. So there's barriers around certification. Now we were working on changing the yes. rules. Yes, there was right. there was some progress made by state board. Gerald, do you want to update there, there, on there that? There are there is some progress, but but it, that 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 rule still exists to, to to the extent that in a final determination, there does need to be. You know, a master's, and the, the issue is as much rule, but it's as much accreditation, or there's accreditation standards as well. And so, so our, our accrediting bodies and colleges often ask for that. And is that something that we should put in legislation? I, I think we've had a superintendent, uh, superintendent president's group working on that, and I think it is something that at some point we need to, whether it gets in legislation or we go back to the state board rule, I think it's something we need to address at a, at a broader level. Because that was in this bill. 
It was another one of those things that got thrown out. It was just kind of a shell of the ambitious thing. And Rob Saxon said, we can do it in rule. It'll be a little more flexible that way. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a favor of the rule process myself, yeah. but I think it's something we need to keep working on. I just came from the Coast Executive Committee uh, board meeting, and my colleagues said that they felt like that was the biggest barrier for them, was that um, certification. In Portland Public Schools and maybe in other districts, I'm sure in other districts, we have a, had a partnership with Portland State where it's a senior inquiry program, and mm -hmm. they have a professor who is certified um, to be a professor. He's his PhD. Josh Bost was ours. And then we had two teachers in physics and in social studies who paired with him. Mm -hmm. And so our teachers could award the high school credit. He could award the college credit. And they team taught. And it was phenomenally low cost for credits. But we didn't have a mechanism in, in the important in public schools for charging students for PSU credit. So again, it, it ultimately, we had to let it go because we didn't have a consolidated budget. It, cost $20,000 for the number of students who ended up wanting those credits with no, no way to charge them in a public school setting. So mm -hmm. I do think cost and certification of teachers, and that it takes an enormous amount of time to connect with PSU to team, and we had three teachers in the room, which isn't really cost effective, although it was a right. fabulous experience. It's, um, well, maybe and so the other model that some people are using is based somewhat on some of the pillars that Eastern Promise has right. used, and that's where the um, faculty from the post-secondary and high school work together to define common outcomes for the courses, common assessments, and in their case, they're actually commonly scoring them so that you um, build that sense of trust and a belief that the rigor that's necessary is there. So that's another piece of how people have been addressing that. It was the best professional development for K-12 for our high school teachers, so too, because that first paper that was assigned, and the high school teachers graded it, and they were IB trained and IB, mm -hmm. you know, very rigorous teachers, and compared to the PSU professor, they had to send it back and have the kids rewrite it because the professor said, no, that's just not going to work. And of course, the kids rose to the challenge. And I would say in terms of equity, the PSU senior inquiry, there's something about Portland State senior inquiry that sounds accessible where international baccalaureate diploma doesn't. So it attracted much more diverse students who didn't necessarily <coughs> see themselves as IB, even though we've been trying to, we have an open access program and we've increased our diversity in IB. But it was a much more diverse uh, group of seniors who took this senior inquiry program. And uh, they did leave with college credits, and that all of them have gone on. So just that confidence to know I am college capable mm -hmm. without having to do something that doesn't. Did that also include career technical classes? Um, ours didn't. Mm -hmm. They may have at Marshall High School mm -hmm. or at Grant High School. I think uh, Jefferson High School, all three of those had senior inquiry through PSU. Most, don't. Okay. Most across the state don't do a very good job with career technical because there just isn't the structures in the high schools generally mm -hmm. to do that. Even in the college where I was president, we actually had to bring them on campus to get to get them to do that because there was no there was no lab structures for that to occur. But that's also one of those other back factors that we need to think about is that the recent investments this year in career technical mm -hmm. education um, with close to nine million dollars no, may also be a, a complementary factor right. that can help with that. Get credits, yeah. Mm -hmm. Senator Hass, were you going to say something? No, I was just, uh, international baccalaureate does sound a little intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. You and everyone yeah. else will be fully capable. <laughs> so I tell the kids, yeah. you can do it. But um, I do think that, the, that part of the 40-40-20, that career technical ed, I really worry in important public schools, but across our state, you know, we have a 60% graduation rate. How are we serving the 40% who aren't graduating on time? And, you know, what are they doing globally? And I'm not finding a lot of countries that, that are preparing 100% for college prep testing and college prep without having that career technical ed piece that's equally rigorous but mm -hmm. parallel. Yes. And I could see that being a really great result from this committee. Mm -hmm. It's getting more and more kids in those career technical um, <coughs> Credits. So what I'm hearing is not just get credits, but we have to be clear that the credits that are put students on a pathway to a degree and that we know for some students it does mean career technical ed, which can be very rigorous, is another way to go in addition to um, the other ways we've talked about, just courses that are in the regular 
you know, program. Computer science, nursing, pre-teaching. That, and that's why I bring up guidance. The guidance is so critical because uh, 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 this, this regular student thing, a uh, high school student that came to a college, looks at the college catalog and is mystified. And, and, you know, that's why I would say, you know, the programs with K-12 can help with some guidance at that, that level, get them off the right start is really important. Yeah. So, you know, another related thing is, and Senator Hass was talking about, do we need to put this in legislation? We did put nine college credits on the Achievement Compact, mm -hmm. which certainly is not the same as legislation, but one thing we're doing this year around the Achievement Compacts, because quite honestly we collected them in the past, but we haven't done an analysis, is to aggregate up and what we would start seeing like if getting nine college credits because becomes one of the things along the pathway that we're not achieving then we have to start talking about well we have and David will do this work why is that do some focus groups and does it need legislation does it need an investment what about it is keeping us from doing it so that will be something that um, I think could be helpful along the, the way with this anything yeah. go ahead if I can go back to the your question about what are the what are the barriers, and um, mm -hmm. I think from the student lens, it's massively confusing. Exactly, you know, first they got to be motivated. You know, you got to get them thinking about college resumes and going to college. So we need we need that, and then we get them to that point. And it's not very clear what 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 classes, what options are available, what translates <coughs> between college credit, university credit. And I'll tell you. Uh, you know, in Ben Lapine, we've got four high schools taking four different approaches for college credit. We have Summit High School that's uh, very embedded with AP. We've got Ben High School with a very open IB program, encouraging the whole population, um, student population to take it. Lapine High School, which is the lowest poverty school, is really focused on CTE credits, which is, which is making it relevant, which is opening eyes. So they're saying, gee, this is something I want to do, and they're aligned with Sun River Resorts, which um, being very supportive of our initiative, and that, that translates in generating student interest, thinking about college. Um, and then we have Mountain View High School, which is really focused on um, articulating with the community college and, and uh, the expanded options. And if you talk to the counselors in these schools, or even in downtown administrators, I mean, just the vast variety of options is, is somewhat overwhelming, and it's very hard to understand. I teach part-time uh, business courses at the community college, and I get asked questions like, "Does this?" I took this, you know, intro to business in high school, and does it count here? And will it count when I go to, you know, OSU Cascades? And so, so a lot of times, very hard to answer that question. So if it's hard for me to figure it out, and I've got, you know, three <laughs> students who were into my high, through high school, it's really confusing for um, for students. So I think we need to develop that clarity, and I think the heck is working on some of those. Should, we've had discussions at the heck about you know making it easier for students to navigate, but once they're motivated, now we got to give them you know, some clear paths aligned with what their interests are, what the community needs are. So I certainly think that's a that's a barrier. So it's those pathways and clarity, but it's also does if I take this course, is it going to get transferred into every one of our universities? There's somewhere you know will some some university will accept it, another one won't, or there's certainly cases with transfer credits where, you know, certain universities say you have to take it again. I think what, at least what people said to me, in some cases they leave it up to the professor to decide or the department head or if it's transferable. You know, it's, sometimes it's not unlikely that a professor thinks what, how they teach is the best possible way. So they look at it coming from someplace else and feel like I still have stuff they need, so they're going to have to take it again. And that particularly um, tends to apply to some of our pre-professional programs or programs like engineering. I was just listening to actually a president of a community college whose son, you know, took all the right courses he thought, and then of course it didn't quite transfer in because of the requirements for a particular um, a high rigor program that had expectations about which courses needed to be taken. So happens a lot. Yeah. In our system. So, you know, I'm going back to our charge, and one thing I'm seeing here um, to encourage efficiencies and to make post-secondary education more affordable for families. I think a lot of these barriers prevent efficiencies for sure. I mean, they, they prevent even um, being able to get into the system. I think something we are going to need to sort out, I heard a few people say, well, the heck's dealing with that, or the, again, you know, it's like, 
So if we look at these, where's the right place to get them solved? I think some will be legislation, some will go to the Higher Ed Coordinating Commission. We have to really think about that. So what, going back to the charge, Senator, do you, when we're really thinking of this charge, is it, should it be narrower than all of this, or do we want to really try to solve these problems? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know that I would make it much more narrow. I, you know, the, I, I think we'd like to have something that's that works in Beaverton and Bend, in the Pine and Portland. That you know, right now, that's just it's just different everywhere. Yeah. And it's different with all the community colleges, and so the interlacing is just you know just all over the map. It's a crazy quilt. Yeah. So all these issues are relevant to doing what we need to do to really allow students to get more um, college credits in high school. So, yeah, I'm referring to myself as the barrier buster. Isn't that kind of my role? And Because yeah. it is managing the transitions and overcoming barriers. So, okay, so maybe partly what we could do as staff is a chart that kind of shows all of these issues and where do we think the best place that these issues are going to Mm -hmm. get solved would be. That would give us some ideas because there's some that are natural to go someplace and then how do we make sure they're, they're informed. Like if it goes to the half, they still have to be very informed by this conversation of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So maybe... There, uh, there's an issue on assessments that I don't fully understand why okay. it is so, you know, technical, uh, why, why it's so difficult. But... Um, uh, Superintendent Saxon thinks it is it's it's very difficult. Just needs a parade of certified smart people to <laughs> study it for a while and set up a new matrix or something. And then and the, uh, how to pay everybody. The financing is really uh, tricky too, and not insurmountable, but tricky. And uh, Saxon uh, uh, and I look at the <coughs> uh, just paying districts per transfer module. Okay, you had this many kids, or you. Can, and as a way that way, that if anything that mo money motivates school districts, and that didn't fly. Then we looked at a way of, of giving each student in high school like the equivalent of fifteen credits to buy, and uh, however, and that that didn't work either. So um, there's ways to do it. We just haven't got there yet. But those are tricky issues. So why why do network paying for credits if if you get a school district to to earn you know, college credits, you could, you know, again, it's sort of the outcome based. It, it might work. It might work down the road, but in our compressed time we had during the legislative session, we just couldn't put it together in the time we had. It is about $800 for a student to earn a full IB diploma, which can take, you know, 30 or more credits to college, which now our or Oregon system acknowledges you as a sophomore if you mm -hmm. complete. Right. And the assessments are internationally benchmarked and nationally recognized and now state recognized to be of college level. You take college level calculus, they accept that. So the assessment issue that he's probably talking about are the classroom-based assessments where you have different teachers like our teachers who might have said that first paper was fine, but to the college level standard, which they haven't been trained on, that wouldn't have been an appropriately passing paper. Mm -hmm. So finding the assessments when it's not an AP or an IB or something that's already been um, mm -hmm. <coughs> or benchmarked, um, I think is part of the issue he's talking about. Right. And I just learned this weekend that the state is giving $425 per student uh, for assessment testing, I think for the Smarter Balanced Assessment. That's about the cost of it, $425 per student. So, I mean, I think we're good. that's three or four college credits for community college credits. And through senior inquiry, um, that amount would have given you closer to 15 college credits, I think. So I don't know if there could ever be a thing where every senior who earns credits gets a certain amount delivered to the state to the school district to do that. But we're spending a lot on testing. It would be nice to spend at least the equivalent on accelerated learning. But that's good. There are some issues. There's just some issues that need to be worked out on assessments. I've told some of you this. The president of Clatsop Community College is a former legislator, Larry Galizio, and they do one. Of the, he said just to get one instructor to go to Astoria High School and teach one advanced algebra class involved a series of meetings, mm -hmm. phone call. It was just you know a lot of work out of one class, one meeting. and you know we're going to try to make this statewide. 
And the Eastern Promise, that, that is a good model, but it's costly and very yeah. time consuming. Yes. Mm -hmm. It would be doing that for every course. They would need to go and align the standards and align mm -hmm. how they do the assessments. So, um, but again, that may be one of the issues that if you can reach that agreement, just like we all trust the IB assessment, and nobody tries to question that, if we were able to reach a point for the state where we got common outcomes and a common assessment developed for some of these courses, that I think would eliminate some of the issues that uh, come up, as you said, when, well, I don't know if your folks can teach that course because the rigor might not be there. So it's another approach. Yeah, so that whole proficiency based. Um, with common. And, you know, the other thing that goes along with that, because it's EPIC, which is um, a research institute, they're the ones who do the, do the, um, you know, they're the ones who look at the syllabus that you use for mm -hmm. IB, and they're the ones that make sure the tests. And they provide a call center for teachers. So if teachers need help about how do I get my syllabus and how do we make sure it's going to lead to getting the score you need, you could decide to do something like that. And, you know, there's models all over the state. I mean, like New York has the New York region exam. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went through that yeah. system myself. You know, that was no It's been reason. around for many yeah. years. Yeah. But, it, you know, it was like I went to South America and an exchange student. When I came back, if I passed the fourth year of Spanish, I had all four years, even if I wasn't in Spanish. So I think what we're doing now is um, we are beginning to just brainstorm possible solutions. This is very early in the process, but I think it... It is important to do. So one other thing related to that is Hilda and David gave a resource list here. And this is what's happening all over the country. Because I think... Um, so when you open this document, everything that is underlined is an active link. And what we tried to do, we organized this, first of all, just to give you some access to the committee resources and to state resources. There's a number of different policies that we may draw upon during this um, work this year, and we wanted you to have access to that, including the regional achievement collaboratives, because several of those are also trying to address this issue. We forgot to mention that as another alignment. Um, the second page starts in with some previous um, legislation and recommendations. This is not the first time this work has been looked at, so we looked at the House Bill 3418 and the expanded options work that was back in 2005. And then starting on page three, you have a number of different states. We looked at Washington, the <coughs> Running Start program. New York just issued um, a, um, the governor um, released a, a statement saying that they're going to expand their successful PTEC program to include um, a number of different programs now and um, to actually 16 different locations around the state with no cost to the student. Colorado, we've had many conversations with folks there who have addressed this issue. They too had some of the very same barriers that we talked about. They have offered to work with us to um, talk through how they addressed policy, how they wrote language that addressed some of the barriers. Um, and it just turns out that the Education Commission of the States is based in Colorado, and uh, they just hired their, um, the governor's education um, advisor who did all of this work as a former um, post-secondary person who was doing credit, dual credit policies and going, ah, it doesn't work. So he's offered to help us with that. Then we outlined a couple of programs, Oklahoma and Tennessee. Uh, these are places that are looking at complete tuition for students for up to two years and pr primarily focusing on first-generation families, students from low-income backgrounds. They do have some caveats, looking at criteria for good coursework. You know, you've got to keep your grades up. Um, they've even, in Oklahoma, I was impressed with this, they found donors that covered the cost of textbooks um, to complement this work. Um, and like you, they pointed out the need for advisors. You can read more about these. We also looked at New Jersey, which also has a scholarship program for 19 community colleges for high school students. And also in California, south of us, the Long Beach Promise has been in, um, in effect for, I think, up to five years. And they have seen a tremendous um, set of positive 
results. That one is only within one community, but it's a combination of a partnership model that takes a school district, community college, and the university. And their, their data is showing that they have really changed the developmental course participation data. Um, How and is it then, similar to the Eastern Promise? Or is it? Um, it's a little bit different. They are not doing um, the <coughs> common assign, uh, assessments there, but they are um, finding ways for the students to contribute. And that's where I thought if we could get some good questions that this group wants, we can dig back in. We have resource people in these states that are very willing to either communicate with us by phone or answer direct questions that we have. Um, and then, you know, get specifically. So that's one we'll add down for you. And they're probably not familiar with Eastern Promise either. So. And then lastly, we put some uh, national resources together for you. As I mentioned earlier, the Education Commission of the States is actually very keen on this agenda. They've received some funding from Lumina, and they've outlined a number of ways that they are willing to facilitate our work because this fits right into the agenda that they are very keen on supporting. They also um, are releasing a set of um, state policies that relate to dual enrollment. They've been scanning the entire nation, so we don't even have to do that work. And they're going to release that in two weeks. And uh, they also have a, um, it's a little bit out of date, but they're guaranteed college admissions policies that we can access. And then just because sometimes the language gets confusing, I'm starting a glossary. <laughs> and if you have contributions that you want to make to that glossary so that as we use the language, because um, there are differences. I mean, there's a whole group that does concurrent enrollment, and they do accreditation of uh, programs that are <coughs> concurrently enrolling students so that they um, meet the accreditation standards. So that, those are resources to get us started. And again, um, that's our role, is that we'll be able to provide more details or follow up with states or models that you want to learn more about. That's good. Uh, I would just point out to the one thing to uh, Principal Chapman and Nori, the study by Brian Fox. Yes, he came that's in here too, I think. About, it's pretty intuitive of you know, uh, what education does to change people's lives, and we've all seen those studies as you know, lifetime yeah. earnings. But this goes into things like, you know, uh, higher education among young people, people especially, get, increases voting regularity, mm -hmm. it increases uh, volunteerism. Support for uh, the arts. Their yes. kids do better, support for the, all, all of these things. It, uh, and, and I guess we all probably thought that, but this is, mm -hmm. he's documented. And it's Oregon specific. That's the third bullet under your committee resources. I, I feel like I've, I've read that report. Did it also show the economic impact in terms of our local economy and what that would do um, in terms of? He had about 18 different factors. I think it even included incarceration rates, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'll review that. Thank you. Part of his conclusion was the point where your $1 investment, your, your returns exceed $1 somewhere in the community college range. After high school, for every dollar invested by the state, you exceed one dollar returns. That's what he testified in front of the committee. Mm -hmm. So that's your kind of tipping point. Explain that. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. So, um, so for every dollar the state spends, there's um, you know we spend between 100 and 120 thousand dollars on K through 12 education per student, and so uh, as you you look at your investment rates of students that do not achieve eighth grade, do not achieve. 12th grade, and then graduate from, uh, take some community college, your investment, your expected returns are less than a dollar, much less than a dollar below 8th grade, less than a dollar in high school, and then once you graduate high school, his research says that in the high school, some college credit area, for every dollar the state spends, they get an anticipated greater than one dollar in terms of lifetime expected earning tax base, savings for things like cost of Medicare, Medicaid, medical attention, things like that. So at least some high school, some high school credit, and then all the way through graduate school, your investment would just mm -hmm. potentially. Everybody goes to graduate school is through. Yeah, yeah. We, we have the same data as we've done at community colleges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we know this is important to do. I mean, mm -hmm. and there's so many um, indicators about that. Um, it, you know, one thing in terms of how do we explore. What models are there out there, or how do we take all of these? I mean, one thing we could do was start with these barriers or opportunities, whichever way you want to talk about them, and 
just decide how do we get them to work together. So, you know, just another one I want to throw out there, and I just recently heard this, but Hilda, you t I think, I don't know if you told me about it, but it's this whole idea in the achievement compacts, the K-12 achievement compacts, there's, the districts are supposed to put, if they have nine college credits, if their students got nine college credits, mm -hmm. we can't get that information from the community colleges because of FERPA. So you, you know, even if the district is paying to send the student up to the community college, and I shouldn't say the district, it's really the state money that comes through the district, we're not then able to know what course it is or even if they got the credit in the course. So, um, so that's another one of, I don't know if that's the exact assessment you were talking about, but a related thing we are doing is... Um, as we're adding all these other relevant things, is um, we have a longitudinal database case that we need to take to legislators, actually, um, <clears throat> I think this session. Mm -hmm. And um, we're really trying to figure out how do we really be able to have data that really lets us know from birth to college and career, how are students doing along the pathway. That will help with some of these issues, but um, so it's another barrier or opportunity just being able to get, to be able to yes. get the credits, to, to know we're getting credits, so. Gerald, some of that work is starting to work through? It, it is. Uh, Conversations with? Several groups that are working, a couple of different groups that are working on it as usual, but uh, no, we are making progress, so I can get you <laughs> back. There, the ODE has gotten some money in one of their strategic uh, initiatives to do some work in the 12-13 time. And so where we are, and I know that they're working hard on some of that stuff. But we have some things yet to do as well. But one of the things you share is exactly right. I mean, you know, I mean, we deal with that also, colleges, and so there's FERPA, FERPA that require us not to do some things that others can't do. So. So how is that money being used? I think it was $3 million that was allocated for exactly this. Yeah, there, you know, it's a project, if I'm correct, and, and I'm, I am I have other, you know, we get uh, some folks who really know. Alder is a project that looks at being able to deal with the K-14 database, and I think there's some work with oh, the current chancellor's office also involved in how do How do we align that system? And we, we were going to have an ODE person here today. I don't know what happened, but we could follow up and get a summary of where that is right now. Yeah, the, the money is housed at ODE. So other, I heard questions, barriers, anything else people want to say before we kind of look at the timeline? So can you, in your document, we just, um, we created a t possible timeline. It's, it's the the one that has your agenda on it. It looks like this. Uh, it's the last two pages. Mm -hmm. So Accelerated Learning Committee, Senate Bill 222. So if you start with the end in mind, this is, um, this is to go to the legislator by October 1st. Mm -hmm. So we have to design back from that. And so we've tried to, Hilda, do you want to do big picture, go over this kind of? Sure. Well, as Nancy said, we did start with looking at where we need to be in, uh, by the end of September and backing that up and just knowing the process of what you all will want in terms of opportunities to give feedback to any drafts and to uh, finalize a report in plenty of time to get that forward. We anticipated that there would be times that we would have face-to-face -face meetings. There could be times that people might be um, working on some piece of it and then sharing, or we might be participating by phone. But we envisioned that probably uh, November, December, January, we might still be collecting information for you and answering questions, presenting that um, for your um, consideration. It, there could be some bringing some guests in that you are wanting to hear from, so very open to that and making sure that uh, we are very clear what they need to bring and what they need to answer. And then I think we've got to, by February, really start thinking about some initial recommendations that would be in the report, and as Nancy said, maybe using the barrier list as a structure for that 
so that we are always, you know, we're not just writing some big ideas, but actually really thinking about um, recommendations that are going to specifically address individual barriers that, that we're aware of, and hopefully more than one sometimes. Um, and then probably um, in making sure that anything that we're recommending, that we're vetting that with other groups that are going to need to carry those things out too, so that we're very um, conscientious that, oh my goodness, we forgot about that piece. And uh, so we have some time in April and May where we may uh, be getting feedback from um, agencies that would take some of the recommendations forward and give us feedback on, oh yeah, that's we can do that, don't forget to put this in, or we need to pay attention to this fiscal piece. Um, with time during the uh, summer primarily to look at drafting and refining and adding and making sure that everybody is good to go. So, And of course this is flexible, but it does give us a timeline to be where we need to be a year from now. Any reflections on this? The next thing we're going to ask you, so what are the next steps for the next meeting after we take a little look at dates? But <clears throat> David, you'll notice in November is where we're really slating to really get going on um, parameters for the fiscal model and, and we might need to keep, might not be done by November because mm -hmm. to me we have to say what is the model right, right. and then what's the cost be of the model. <laughs> but you can early on give us some parameters, right? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so any other questions about this, uh, this schedule? I think the schedule is good. I, this is a little bit outside of our scope, but I, I would like to talk to you and Gerald maybe about doing something for the February session on this issue mm -hmm. of uh, you know master's degrees and, and okay. in the field. Oh, great. You know, <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. We've got an omnibus education bill all teed up, ready for technical changes like that. That's to be able to teach the class. Yes. That, yeah. yeah, and we're hearing more and more data about uh, teachers with with uh, masters in education. Right. Okay. So well, that happened as Measure Five. A lot of the programs <laughs> shifted over to an MAT program rather than um, an undergrad degree, where you might come back and get a master's in a content area. Mm -hmm. But even now, a lot of the master's programs that people are going back and getting, if they did start out with an undergraduate, they may or may not be getting a a, a full. Um, you know, set of credits per se in the content area. So mm -hmm. we could do some research on on also yeah, we'll what other options language wise could help fix that problem. So maybe we need to know what really are the rules, yep. laws. Um, what's, I, I get yeah, what's the problem, and then start really hearing about possible solutions. Yep. Just do some research around that. Yeah, we had we actually had language in the, that Cindy Hunt authored. Uh, from the Department of Education, and uh, we'll go back and hit, hit pull that up and floor. make sure that's yeah that could be next meeting. <coughs> I, I'm more than happy to deal with that next meeting or whenever you'd like to. So, okay. what specifically is that is that issue? If uh, your master's isn't in uh, math or calculus, right. then it, it's you can't teach uh, college credit, and a lot of teachers get their master's in education, right. but they specialize in math. But yet, they're and ironically, it it impacts the community the, colleges. Hmm? At the four-year institutions, that doesn't necessarily apply. Well, how big of an accreditation so. issue is that, actually? I, it is an issue. So, I mean, I mean you have, how big? Is You're going to bring the problem I'll, to I'll us. I'll bring it all time. back to you. Okay, <laughs> and then you'll work with Hilda, and we'll yeah, absolutely. even look at some I'm more than happy to at any time. possible solutions. Because if we're talking this session, which I hope yep. we are, we're not that far off. No, uh, deadline for legislation intro is next week. It's not quite next week, end of November, but everybody should yep. pretend like it's next week. Uh, okay, but you'll hold a bit, we'll have a bill or something. Okay. Yep. okay, so let's, for next time, we really want to clearly understand what the problem is here and some possible solutions. We also want to know, I hear you have a group who's working on this. Where are you with it? The, last year we are, right now, we're kindling that. We're brought sex mm -hmm. and they're getting that back together to work. Okay. So we think that's doable by our next meeting. Mm -hmm. And this is outside of the scope, but honestly, I hope that that conversation then pushes a bigger conversation around teacher prep as we talk about teacher effectiveness. Um, you know, it's th there have been in the past some teachers who didn't have an undergraduate degree in mathematics who were teaching mathematics with a master's in teaching and an endorsement because they could pass a test. 
a single test, you know, and then have some student teaching experience. But, I mean, if we're really going to ramp up our teacher effectiveness, we're going to have to do a better job with our teacher <coughs> prep. And maybe, you know, law school is a three-year program. Maybe on down the road they create a dual um, MAT, so it's a master's in teaching, but a master's, master's in your content area too, master's in math. Because, you know, sitting there for 15 months and talking about teaching without focusing on the content, especially if you haven't been in an undergrad program in a while, um, or you don't even have an undergraduate degree in that content area, it, it's very hard then to be a master teacher in the classroom. And it's true that kids need to know that you care before they care about learning in your class, but they need to know that you know your content mm -hmm. before they're going to also respect that. So I think this is a huge area in our country particularly where we could really be shoring up the content knowledge of our teachers in our classrooms, especially if we're going to get them to advance learning. Is that something Chalkboard is looking at, Nancy? With the Chalkboard, they're, they're doing uh, five projects that are really focused on bringing together um, a combination of colleges, universities, and school districts um, in focusing on aspects of better recruiting, looking at admission requirements, um, stronger clinical practices, engaging school personnel with um, faculty from those educator prep programs, and better practices around interviewing and hiring of those candidates. And then lastly, looking at induction and mentoring programs that really help those candidates be successful. Um, there's not a specific avenue that's looking just at um, what you're describing, but I think some of the conversations in these partnerships will evolve into, oh, here are some ways we could strengthen these programs. Part of it is there haven't been real avenues to bring um, those partners together to, to have really um, substantive conference conversations over time about how we can work together to have high quality educators. So in terms of the next meeting, so far I have, you know, we're going to get the, 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 the laws, the rules, what's the problem with that, look at some possible solutions. Um, what else do, uh, you know, I think the other thing that might be good is we start looking at these barriers and we start getting clear kind of nationally, if we can chunk these, who's really doing something with yeah, this? And that's an easy way to use so, the resources that we've got. And do you think next time we'd want to have someone come in from e ECS? Because we, we could send them our list ahead of time. Right. ECS is an organization that really has the scope across um, all the states. So they could come in, look at our barriers or... Um, they even offered to do something called a policy audit where they would actually look at our existing policies and give us, okay, based on our analysis of what other states have done that have moved the mark on this, here's what we find are your areas that you could strengthen and here's some language that could be done to, to could be used to do that. So, It occurs to me that, that if we look at this barrier, some, some primary preliminary information for the committee might be helpful on how we fund the two systems, mm -hmm. you know, if we're going to talk about how to change the funding of the two systems, it might be helpful to do a little 10-minute yep. thing on how do how are they currently funded, for example, and so you know you might want to take all the barriers and talk about, you know, is there a practice that we're doing now that that the community needs to understand before we move on to the to the next steps on how to change things. Okay, so why don't we um, say we'll start working with the ECS people around the barriers and start looking at the policy. We'll also you're saying let's get clear about how we currently fund right. so people are aware of that so then we can think of that as seemed, we shift. Seemed to be the first step for me is make sure we all have a common understanding of it, or all the committee have a common yeah. understanding of it. I also think that your program that, you, that you're familiar with, because um, that came up in our research also and it seemed like a, a very promising piece um, that maybe you can put, we can be in touch and talk about how best to pull the pieces into these barriers, because I think it's addressing some of those areas. The so. senior inquiry? Yes. Senior well, and also the having a professor teach alongside that is teachers. The, yeah, that is the that same. senior yeah. inquiry. Because Matt Coleman, he was one of the people at the table, and when he was at West, was at Westview and Beaverton? Same program. Yeah. Same program. Yeah. Okay, so he's he's another okay. good good resource for you there. I want you all to know I'm not sick. I get this thing when the weather changes for two weeks. I do get that too. I cough and 
so it's not contagious or I wouldn't be here because that's the last thing you need, but I know it's annoying. I apologize. So, Okay, so given what we're doing next, I wanted, we wanted to just sort of think about dates, and I think the way to begin, there's two ways to go about finding dates. One is we come up with a predictable, like the fourth Thursday, um, knowing that things will come up, or the others, we just try to do it month to month. So I'm just going to go around and see from the committee members which is better, to try to come up with a predictable date or just try to do it more based on, you know, a few months ahead. So, Nori, do you have a preference? Set, set the predictable date would probably make it easier to schedule. In a moment, yeah. Senator Hath? I would, I would concur, and I, I mean, I know I haven't gone through this a number of times. It, we're, there's always going to be conflicts down mm -hmm. the road. Everybody's, you know, we're not going to get 100 percent. Okay. Where, where Payton, are other Payton, committee members? Payton. I agree. Okay. And, and uh, Representative Huffman. Representative Huffman? Uh, whatever you guys decide, I'll be there. <laughs> okay. So that's the... That's Everyone else had predictable, so we'll right. just go with a predictable date. So, um, <clears throat> given that, I mean, uh, Hilda, there's a Wednesday, November 13th. That what is that? Is that the second Tuesday or the the third Tuesday? It's probably the second Tuesday, is my guess. Well, well, second <coughs> Tuesday is second uh, Wednesday. OEID. Second Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. We want to avoid the second Tuesday. But second Wednesday, Wednesday the might be good. Day of the week for me or Wednesdays. <laughs> what, I used Wednesdays. to just a Wednesday. So that was great. really fabulous. <laughs> but if they're good for other people, Wednesdays are the only day of the week that some first, second, or third, there isn't something routinely scheduled. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to move everything else. I have to. So the 13th is the second Wednesday. Um, That's the day after OEIB, which could be yes. good, because mm -hmm. then we can bring back and keep us Network. aligned. Are all the meetings in Portland, too, or we drive around? The um, well, this, this particular time, we looked at where the members were located, and so many of you were up in this area that we chose to come up here to this room. It's not a great room for large audiences, um, but people can always phone in, too. Um, and I think that we'll have to just consider drive time because it pri primarily will be the three of us and Gerald and folks from ODE. So, so they could be it's really Salem. your preference. Mm -hmm. Is and Portland work best for the members? I'm here. I think I'm hearing from you. It does. It's you fantastic. I'm going to leave here and go to my site council meeting on time, but I don't really want to. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's you know one thirty or later. Okay, so okay. afternoons. One yeah, thirty works. Earlier. So one. Th should we say one thirty to three? Starting November thirteenth. And the good news would be that in December, um, that would place it on the eleventh. Um, which is not going to run into the holidays. And then in uh, January, that would place it on the 8th. Now, that's that still works. The professors would still be on vacation, but they should be back by then. should be back. <laughs> and uh, February, that would be February 12th. There will be a legislative session yeah. going on in February, yeah. maybe. So we may want to meet in Salem if may want to do it. we can work around that, or may... May, may not meet that month. Well, you know, that was my original thought, but maybe it makes sense to do it then. We could meet right across the street at OEIB or, okay. Or someplace at the Capitol. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's what happened when we looked at the, the next week in November was we were concerned that your legislative days would yeah. preclude. And March, that would be the 12th. And April, the 9th. And May 7th, and June 11th. <coughs> and that's pretty okay. July, I'm running through the whole calendar okay. here. July 9th, <laughs> August 13th, and the last meeting, September 10th. 
Okay, then our report mm -hmm. goes forward. Yes. <laughs> just think of the possibilities. If yeah. we, and I'm determined we're going to make this yes. work, just think of what we're doing for the youth and in the state. It's just very exciting, I think. So, okay, good. Anything else we need to This go? is a great time, too, to say if there's something specific that we talked about that um, you particularly want to see more of. Representative Huffman, I want to make sure that if there are things that you would like data on or more specifics that you have an opportunity to request. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. And I'll, I'll probably touch base with Nancy tomorrow afternoon and, and go over some stuff um, and talk about the phone situation. I'm going to try to be present personally at the meetings. The phone is a little bit of a challenge with people not muting cell phones and whatnot, so um, I will prefer to be in the room if at all possible. And also, uh, Representative Frederick is actually on a plane as we speak, or he would have been phoning in, and, and uh, Senator Starr is out of town. So we'll get these dates out to their folks immediately, make sure that they can get it on their calendars as well. Beautiful. Representative Huffman, I'm thrilled to be coming to your community tomorrow. Thanks. Glad to have you, and it sounds like we're going to have a big turnout. Oh, good. That's great. I appreciate that. So um, should we just, for the members, debrief just how did you feel about the meeting? And debriefs are usually in case there's, well, what worked and what would you need to even make it a better meeting. So... Nora, you want to start? No, I think this was very, um, very good start. Just started throwing some ideas out on the table, and uh, it's great to have the resources and and um, get the presentation next meeting. So we're all speaking the common language. My, you know, if I can interject a question, I, I would assume between you and Hilda that um, that whatever we're doing is in line with what OEIB is thinking <laughs> and Heck is, you know, working on. Yeah. And I would imagine that this is a group that's really focused on this issue, or are there parallel studies going on? I definitely, um, we're keeping uh, Ben Cannon and uh, the heck involved so that they are aware of this. He may join us at some meeting, so uh, definitely there'll be alignment there. And uh, Nancy <laughs> uh, definitely sees this as something that aligned with where OEIB is, and probably have updates for the board on this mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Senator Hass. This was a good start. Representative C C Huffman. Yes. Uh, we're just debriefing <laughs> the meeting. Um, I, I think I already said it. it. It's better for me to be in the room. Uh, okay. In the, it, it's a challenge being on the phone because the speaker within the room is two feet further from one member than another, and so you, you can't adequately hear. And um, those of us on the phone weren't really, you guys didn't take a breath. <laughs> didn't really jump in to say anything, but it, it's not a big deal. I think the first meeting went fine. I think we're on the right track. And I'm, I took a lot of notes that, that I'll be uh, uh, talking to you, Nancy, about, and then also uh, bringing to the next meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Also, the uh, resource documents that you all have and that are now posted on the OEIB website, um, there's a lot in that that you can uh, <coughs> dig further into. Um, so I think that would be a useful document to uh, kind of look, look through and, and go to the links. And if there's any questions that come up from that that can still guide our uh, agenda for next time and getting you more information, we'd be glad to do that. I just said that we, like, oh, yeah. yeah, David and I will. <laughs> Does everyone have resource, like your email and my we have email? All, and uh, we can uh, put that together and send it out to the members. So if people think in between yeah. or, um, you know, we can keep yeah. each other informed. Peyton, did you, didn't get, did you get the comment yet? Yeah. I got more than enough time to talk. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, was, it was great. I just, it's, there's so much good work that we can do in our state. And uh, it's inspiring. And I guess my only thing is the way I leave almost every meeting is there are always so many embedded tensions between doing everything by design so that every kid has a, the on-ramp to these opportunities and then leaving it loose enough where there's no one cookie-cutter approach. And I actually like the four options you mentioned in your district, that kids have those kinds of choices, but they need to know about them and how to access them. So it was, it was inspiring. 
Okay, so you like the tight, loose system. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> he's all about tight, loose, unless you're not achieving well, then we get tighter. <laughs> yeah, I, I think tight, loose, tight, we call it. A straight accountability <laughs> system is a downward spiral, just a straight accountability. Right. Whenever you get innovation and inspiration, right. it helps on the upward draft. Okay, mm -hmm. well said. Good. All right, thank you so much. Are you going to take public comment at your meeting? Oh, that's a really good question. You Under, should. Yeah, we certainly it's can. And there's meeting. also a couple of procedural pieces here on the third page behind the uh, agenda. Uh, just to review, this was what was stipulated in the Senate bill, um, that a majority of members constitutes a quorum for transaction, that official action requires approval of the majority. Uh, we can define a majority. Um, so do you have an option that you want to put forward as a... Defining a majority, because that's different ways that different people define that. So, Any proposals about that? One more than 50% or? That encourages us to show up. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would yeah. say the majority is more than 50% of those okay. who are present. Okay. 50% present. Okay. Um, we've done the uh, third one, which was that we needed to uh, elect a member to serve as chairperson. If there's a vacancy, uh, the appointing authority, which in this case would have been the President of the Senate, uh, Speaker of the House, and the Governor, would make an appointment to become immediately effective if somebody wasn't able to fulfill their year-long commitment here. We'll meet at times and places specified by the call of the chairperson or of a majority of the members of the committee. So it sounds like we'll be sending that out for... Uh, does this room work for folks? We also were thinking about... Portland Community College, if we meet up here. I There's think we not need a, lot a bigger of, room. Yeah. And uh, we asked for the boardroom. It, they said it wasn't available. Hmm. <laughs> well, they might be set up for yeah. <laughs> Well, it works, works for me. It probably should accommodate more people. Than... Well, let's, let's look around and see. Maybe there's a bigger room here we can. Maybe in advance we can book the boardroom. Yeah. yeah, and now that we know the dates, I can do that uh, today and try to get that on. And then we have the right to adopt the rules that are necessary for the operation of the committee. <laughs> okay. So uh, one thing is that um, I can send you all a note when there's something large as an attachment that is being posted so that uh, everybody knows that it's up there, or I can send it as attachments to your email, or we can do both. So public testimony, do we have a few minutes. Did yeah, you want to this time. time testify on anything? Or you I would, actually. Okay, great. Um, I, my name is Margaret DeLacy, and I'm here on behalf of the Oregon Association for Talented and Gifted. And I just wanted to say you've talked about barriers. And as the mother of three gifted kids and somebody who counsels a lot of tag families, I think you missed a big one, which is middle school. Mm. Um, students really, if they're going to be in advanced math in particular, need to be on track by middle school. And I see kind of a, a clash coming with the Common Core Standards. Um, the supposedly more rigorous math instruction has discouraged a lot of schools from um, allowing students to accelerate, which will then make it much harder for them to access some of these college level classes at the other end. And I really think that we need, there are also issues with um, middle school students getting <coughs> high school credits that then makes it possible for them to get the college credits at the other end. And I really think you need to step on this train a little bit earlier in the process. I just, but can you reply? We really aren't supposed to do okay, any public comment, but we'll write it down. So <laughs> I really, you know, appreciate mm -hmm. that. So, any other public comment? We have some other people here. Well, I didn't come prepared, but I would piggyback on what she just said because I had a, I've got a middle schooler um, at, at, in Portland Public Schools, and I met with the high school principal that she'll be going to just about that. Um, well, it was actually about opting out of the yeah. Oaks test, but um, we did talk also about this idea that the way the middle schools have aligned to Common Core, um, they won't be able to get, I guess, a full year of calculus, um, and then there are certain uh, high-end universities that really require that for kids to be um, accepted. A full year, did you say, of calculus? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. So they used to be able to get two high school credits in math, and now they can only get one. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? No? So we will add a item on our agendas to make sure that that's always there. And we'll use our standard protocol, which is three minutes, and you're, you're welcome to put things in writing if you want, and then we'll consider them. Thank you very much.